So he will talk about multi-class model fitting by energization and model seeking. Okay. Hello, thank you, Ivan, for the introduction. And the title maybe looks menacing, but actually you, most of you know about this problem. So um, the problems I will be talking about, aha, uh -huh, we, hold on. to duplicate. Oh, no, it's fine. Okay. Okay, so uh, the problems I'll be talking about you are actually familiar with. So model fitting is uh, interpreting data that have been observed, measured uh, in terms of instances of certain classes of functions. So the first class of problems which I call single class single instance fitting problem is something that most of you encountered at a secondary school. Um, you are get given a set of points, maybe measured uh, in a physics class, and you are supposed to fit a line that maybe minimizes the sum of squares. This is called a single class because the only thing you are fitting are lines, and single instance because you are asked to find one single line. Um, this problem has a very old history and um, it's easy to solve in closed form, no problem. Slightly more pr complicated problem which appears in real applications is that you are given data which come from your single instance, from a single model, the line, but there are also outliers, points that do not satisfy the single model. In most real world problems, outliers appear, either rarely or very commonly. In computer vision, Almost all problems involve outliers, measurements grossly involved with errors. Then the third level uh, that I'll be talking about is single class multi-instance problem fitting. That's the third line where you have uh, an image with uh, multiple points and like three dense areas w which should be interpreted by a line. So we are still looking for one class of objects the class are lines, and uh, the interpretation includes multiple instances here, the red, green, and blue line. And I have an abbreviation for that, SCMI, single class multi-instance. And then the most complex form of the problem is multi-class, multi-instance fitting problem, where we have data, the data includes instances of multiple classes of objects. So here the classes would be two lines, infinite lines, and circles, circles of arbitrary radius. And the problem is to interpret the data in terms of a set of circles and straight lines. Now, these uh, first slides, on the first slides, these could look like toy-like images, but actually many real-world problems uh, could be formalized as single class, single instance, multi-class, single instance, and, and many other versions of these problems. So I'll give some examples, and one would be maybe counting of coins or counting of cells, which more generally would be detection of geometric primitives. The image on the right, the blue one, is traces from bubble chamber, where you would like to interpret the image, which is a collection of pixels, as a set of curves, and the curves could be defined parametrically, and there are multiple instances of these curves. The second uh, row is a pair of images of the, as it happens, Chinese walls, where someone, based on analysis of patches like we saw before, uh, established correspondences. Some of those correspondences, which are visualized by line segments, are correct, and some of those uh, correspondences are incorrect, and our problem is to find, uh, sorry, our problem is to find uh, the epipolar geometry, which is uh, a relation between the two set of coordinates, uh, capturing the movement of the camera and the 3D structure, and uh, establish, separate correct correspondences from outliers. Another geometric example could be given a pair of images of a scene, detect or planar surfaces, um, but also more complicated problems like given a set of tracklets from a video, 
separate those into multiple rigid moving bodies. So a rigid moving body would again satisfy the epipolar constraint, which is some constraint on the coordinates of its positions of the points. And if you have a set of moving objects, everybody will have a different model. So this will be single class, multiple objects. You can imagine other problems like satellite images uh, finding uh, outlines of rectangular buildings. Here the class would be the set of rectangles and instances would be every single image, uh, building, sorry. Okay, so let's start historically. I'll go slowly. So the old, oldest problem is the least squares problem. Give me, given a set of points here in 2D, can uh, be in any arbitrary set of dimensions, find the line best fitting the point. So we have to also say what is the best fitting. Um, to do that, we first find the parameterization. Actually, the case of lines is a is little bit uh, non-trivial because we have this convenient uh, homogeneous parameterization of the line, which we all know from a secondary school, but it's redundant. Uh, uh, and uh, the, uh, in image processing, it's more common to use the radial uh, parameterization which is, a, which is very closely related to the homogeneous, uh, the cosine square plus sine square uh, equals one, and that's the, that's the link. After we check the parameterization, um, we have to define some residual, um, and in the, in the case of line fitting, the standard residual would be the distance to the line. So we have uh, the space in which we are searching, we have the cost function, and in this case, uh, we can get the optimal parameter uh, called theta, here denoted theta star, which is the minimum over all possible set of parameters of a cost function which adds. So we have an additive cost function which adds individual uh, residuals from the points. And this can be solved by what we now call uh, singular value decomposition, but it's easily uh, solved. Uh, in closed form. Now, uh, if we look at it more formally, um, we need the concept of the model class. The model class is the set of lines here. We, need a set, we have the set of points. The output is to find a single instance minimizing the, th uh, the, cost, fu the cost function. The residual is a square residual. And this problem goes down to, uh, goes back to Gauss in early 1890s and actually Laplace before him uh, pr suggested minimizing the sum of absolute differences, which is a little bit more difficult problem, but also solvable fairly easily. Now, as soon as outliers enter the game, this is an example of a set of points generated from a, from a line plus outliers here more or less uniformly distributed inside a square. The least squares fit will give us uh, a solution which is not correct and it could be arbitrarily wrong. As soon as we get into this problem, um, another, another example of it with uh, maybe structured outliers, the outliers could be random but also could have a source which has certain structure. The least squares fit is useless and we have to reformulate the problem. The reformulation uh, appeared like in the 80s, so notice that to move from least squares fitting to robust least square fitting, it took about 200 years. And uh, the, the proposal was to replace the sum of squares with the sum of some uh, function truncated, which makes sure that the uh, outlier influence is not big. Uh, the most commonly used is either um, zero one cost function. So if your error on the small, uh, uh, the error is small, the c penalty for that is zero. Uh, if it's bigger than a threshold, um, we add one, or we might have a truncated uh, least squares problem where for small errors we have a quadratic cost and then a constant. Now, this problem is very hard. It's not efficiently solvable. That doesn't mean that papers don't appear that solve this problem exactly using branch and bound techniques, but the, the price for the exact solution is that there is no guarantee about the time uh, uh, for achieving, for computing the solution. 
And what is interesting, and that's why I brought it up, uh, is that the uh, computer vision community, namely Fischl and Bose, proposed an algorithm which somehow addresses this problem before statisticians, uh, Rusu, who was working on robust statistics, uh, came with his algorithm of least median of squares. So um, I guess that 95% of the audience uh, were familiar with uh, least squares. I don't know what is the percentage of uh, audience familiar with RANSAC, so I'll review the algorithm. So we don't have an efficient, and there is no efficient way of calculate, solving this problem. So we resort to a randomized algorithm. This is one of the randomized, first randomized algorithms proposed. And it goes on like this. Um, so you are looking for a line, take a sample from the set, minimal sample, the smallest one, which specifies all the parameters here of a line, two points, fit, calculate residuals, select points for which we compute no penalty, calculate the number of outliers, outliers are black points, inliers are green points, repeat, and sooner or later we might be lucky enough to hit uh, a pair of points which are all both inliers and we get a solution which is close to the ground truth, to the correct one. Now, uh, maybe more formally, uh, just uh, from top, we need the input data. We need a way of estimating uh, the parameters of the instance given a sample from the data. So here we needed a um, function that given two points produced the line parameters of the lines, this is easy. We choose our cost function. Um, the tricky part may be the scale of the inliers, the threshold sigma. We have chosen our uh, cost function, which is the sum uh, of the function f, which is equal to the number of outliers. We choose our uh, confidence of the solution, and the algorithm can be summarized by randomly select a subsample, that's why it's called RANSAC, evaluate obtain the parameters, that's line four. Line five, evaluate the cost function. Line six, check whether your solution is so far the best. And if it is, just remember the theta star and the value of the best solution, and then iterate until certain condition is met. And one of the very nice properties of RANSAC is that it gives you uh, a, at least a probabilistic guarantee that uh, with your chosen eta, if you take into account the cardinality of the uh, data set, which means the number of points, the quality of the cost uh, the so, uh, solution so far, which is J star, and the number of iteration, you know the probability that a better solution exists, and you can have a probabilistic guarantee. Once you f finish the loop one, two, three, four, five, eight, you take your inliers and polish the solution with local optimization, say, these squares. So this algorithm is now uh, 33 years old, nice age, and it has been used thousands of times. Now, uh, the probabilistic guarantee tells us how long it, we should sample, and it's a function of the confidence and the number of inliers. We don't know the number of inliers, but we have a lower bound because our solution so far surely has less points than the optimal solution. Okay, so um, RANSAC works for uh, lots of problems. It's a nice workhorse, for instance, in software for 3D reconstruction, which we just saw demonstrated. You see that if the number of parameters, like for a line, is small, it can handle very high outlier ratios, like up to 70%. And uh, if you have large number of parameters, it doesn't work. You see that you would need a huge number of uh, samples to take. Fine. But there is one more problem with RANSAC. And I'm mentioning it because you'll see in this story that sometimes in this type of algorithms, small changes of the algorithms make big changes in the performance. So it was observed that the theory, which was on the previous slide, which said that we need a certain number of samples to get a good solution, was not working, and, and the RANSAC was running much longer. 
maybe three, four times. And this was due to this phenomenon. We say, uh, okay, uh, we were assuming that if we get a good inlier sample, like this two red points, w the solution will be quite close to the correct one, and the inlier outlier separation will be correct. But there are surely some inlier samples that do not produce a nice solution, like these two points which are close to, uh, together. It turns out that if you run repeatedly ransack and only sample on inlier points, it's not a, uh, uh, the resulting model will have not 100% inliers, this is actually quite rare, but a whole distribution. So the assumption is that said, well, if I take an all inlier sample, I'll be doing fine, was not correct. It turns out that a one line change of the algorithm will fix this. So what we were doing, and this is the textbook algorithm, it was saying, okay, just remember this uh, so far the best model and the cost function, and then when you finish, polish the solution with the local optimization, it's enough to do one thing and move this inside the loop. This looks like, okay, he's just telling us the standard story that if you do more optimization and you do more uh, computation, you'll get a better solution, but it's easy to prove that this loop is executed very rarely, logarithmically, because um, the samples are in, at random, uh, the probability that your sample will be so far the best is 1 over k, and the number of times this is executed is sum over 1 over k, and this is less than logar logarithm of the number of loops, so it's not important. So the message is, okay, sometimes we can I fix easy uh, easily problems that look fun, fun, like annoying. And yes, it works. Now, um, let's move to a more complicated problem. So Ransack was good for single instance problems of a single class. And now, often we are solving more challenging problems. Imagine this is a satellite image where we have to maybe trace ships uh, on the sea or some trajectories of airplanes. So here we have multiple instances of a single class. Yes, uh, RANSA can somehow be used in an iterative manner, but the effectivity is very low because sampling, pro probability of sampling two points from one of the models becomes very low with multiple instances. This problem was first addressed in 62. So it's interesting that this problem of detecting multiple instances uh, was solved, addressed for the, like in the modern era earlier than the problem of single instance and it's the standard solution still used I guess in the industry today was half-transform. So half-transform was uh, published by a, a patent in 1962 so this is like a 55 year old approach and half transform operates like this. Um, first, maybe we can see that again, we are evaluating a very similar cost function in half transform. We'll be calculating for every parameter uh, some sum of contributions from individual points. And we are still, uh, I'll be explaining the half transform on the problem of finding a line and uh, about the contribution of a single point. So this is a single point in the image here, and that point lies on a manifold, one-dimensional manifold, that point lies on a one-dimensional manifold of straight lines. The lines are color-coded, and in the R theta parameterization of the line, which line is, R is the distance from the origin, and theta is the angle, um, we can say that the same point lies on all of these, sets of lines and we can say add one to the quality, to the hypothesis uh, that the colored line is correct. Now if we have more points in the image, like here we have seven points, each point will vote to the set of possible lines but only in one point the set will intersect and the accumulator, that's how it's called in half transform, the maximum of the accumulator will be taken as an indicator of the presence of the line. So now, 
Okay, this can be generalized to other things, uh, but since we need the um, accumulator space, we cannot deal with high dimensional problems. So maybe uh, detecting a circle which has three parameters, the center and the radius is fine, the accumulator will be 3D, but in geometric problems we often deal with entities like homographies uh, or epipolar geometries which have much higher dimensionality and the accumulator space is non-practical. Nevertheless, um, half transform can be fairly easily, unlike RANSAC, used on the problem of uh, single class multi-instance. So, I'm showing here a page from a paper in 87 by Garrick who proposed uh, um, an extension of half transform to multiple lines. And the algorithm works like this. Okay, so we have an image um, full of uh, lines. Then we have the accumulator space. What we do, we vote as I described before. And the global maximum in the half transform is deemed to be the, the line, so maybe we have the first line, and then we remove the support for the mode. So I'm using this to, uh, to show that the idea of a mode in the parameter space uh, is important, and uh, after removing the support for the mode, we can repeat and go for the all other significant modes. So it's like voting with every single agile, getting the maximum, wiping out uh, all the pixels that supported the line, and we repeat. So we can think about it that there was some sort of a labeling problem where we greedily assigned the label to the modes of the accumulator space. By the way, notice the title of the paper, A New Approach to Object Recognition. So if you compare it with this day, so the object recognition was uh, finding these line segments in the, in the image. Now today, if you hear about object recognition, it's about a cat, dog, uh, skier, and so on, uh, and this is exactly 30 years from back, so the progress of computer vision has been enormous, but still there are problems of this nature, uh, as I said, detection of road networks, buildings, and so on. But even in geometry, vanishing lines, like lines are important entities and circles, now, half transform has a fundamental problem. So, I don't know what you see in this image, but I hope that you see these as um, how many? Three plus three plus four, ten. That you see ten short segments of various orientation. Now, if you think about it a little bit, what will half return? Well, half. This is probably the solution that you would like. Unfortunately, uh, these straight vertical lines have support 10, and those short segments have support 7. So, Gehrig's algorithm will, produce, will not produce the uh, desired solution. Even if we wanted one single line, it will not uh, return the, so the, these short segments. And if you think about it, the, any algorithm which will evaluate the quality of the model theta with a function with only unary terms where we are summing up uh, contributions of individual pixels uh, will not return the correct solution because the cost function is simply higher for the vertical line than what we desire. So the problem is not in the algorithm, the problem is in the formulation. So what can we do? Um, uh, okay, we'll move, um, we, we, will, we will say what, what, how can this be solved after introducing a multi-instance problem because it turns out that working on multi-instance fitting will solve the problem as well. So I will just formalize it, what we are trying to do now. So what Huff was doing iteratively, uh, we'll try to make as an optimization problem. So what we are given, we are given a, a, the set of points X and we would like to output a certain number of instances, one to an i, and this can be seen as a labeling problem. So every point in the input set will be given one label, and we would like to, uh, the labeling to be optimal uh, so that 
assignment of label of points to labels um, and parameters of the instances are optimal. Uh, it turns out that if we go into multi-instance fitting, um, we can reformulate even RANSAC slightly differently that for a long time people thought about RANSAC as a single instance with a, quadra with a specific um, loss function, but maybe it's much simpler, it, w it will, turns out it will, be, it will be simpler to think about robust RANSAC, uh, RANSAC as an algorithm which does multi-label, multi-instance uh, fitting where you have two classes, one class would be an outlier and the other one would be the line class. Okay, and now uh, Boykov in 2010 introduced uh, a method for addressing the single class multiple instance method by posing it as an energy minimization problem where besides the unary term and everything that we've been doing so far had a unary term. Unary term is the term which says how well does my point fit the instance. They added the spatial regularization term which says um, okay, it's a, we, it's a pairwise term which takes uh, into account positions of two points and we can interpret this that close points are likely to belong to the same model instance. The same thing is true for outliers, the pairs of uh, points which are near us equally likely, are more likely to be, uh, have the same label of outliers and inlier classes. Plus they added a third part of the energy which penalizes introduction of new labels. So they are, uh, they, uh, Boykov and Isaac uh, said, okay, mm, single class multi-instance fitting is nothing more than minimization of an energy which is a function of the labeling. The labeling uh, has the term which defines, this depends on the alignment, of, like the correctness of the point to mo uh, instance or point to mode assignment. Then there is the uh, spatial coherence, a pairwise term, and the last one says we don't want too many labels. So we didn't even touch it, but when we talked about half transform, uh, in the half transform we said every mode was given a new line, but somehow we have to stop somewhere. What is a mode that is important enough? And this is here solved by a, regular, by a regularization term. So, okay, we can argue that even this cost function doesn't have all the terms and maybe it's not fully modeling the situation, but surely it's much better than uh, the situation where we said, okay, only the model to point assignment is important. Okay, it turns out that um, um, this type of cost function can be uh, is just a graph minimization problem and there are efficient methods to do that and uh, Boykov and Isaacs and Hossam proposed to do this by an algorithm called alpha expansion. Alpha expansion is a series of graph cuts uh, on a graph which is, may, which is uh, computed um, on, the, uh, on the neighborhood relationship on, on of the points. Now, um, we can also extend uh, easily the Perl algorithm to have a cost per label which is different for different types of labels. So introducing a line would be less expensive than introducing a circle because the circle would have more degrees of freedom. Okay, so how does Perl work? The Perl algorithm works like this. We start with some randomly sampled data and do an initial labeling. So. The idea of RANSAC that at the beginning when we know nothing, this problem is not solvable efficiently, it's MP hard. We start by taking random samples data, initializing uh, instances, and then we would run an iteration loop. Label data so that, the cr uh, s that we decrease the energy. If we manage to decrease it, stop. So. The, the, proper, the nice property of this algorithm is that we don't have to say before how many instances we want to detect. That's property of the algorithm. Um, the initialization is similar to RANSAC, but there are weaknesses. Like in RANSAC, we don't have to say how many loops we'll be taking the, because there's this nice stopping criterion, but here somehow the user has to say how many instances will be generated. It's also very slow, Perl, uh, because 
it has to do the worst case thing, which means uh, we start with a very high li ha la large number of instances and then the number of instances is dropping. Uh, on the other hand, it introduced the pairwise term, which had many interesting consequences. So this might be an example of how parallel runs. Uh, top left, you see the line segments which are randomly initialized. Um, the colors show the um, assignment of points to lines after initial uh, labeling and then we iterate and after convergence we get quite a nice result. So we played with this um, algorithm and we noticed some problems. So um, these, this is a comparison of uh, three methods, T-linkage recently published at CDPR, Perl, and a method that we propose and I'll be talking about uh, in the rest of the lecture. And uh, what you see here is that the, the original image with ground truth overlaid, then the edge map, and this is the collection of data that we are fitting to. Uh, red lines show false positives, which means geometric structures which are not uh, there, uh, not covered, no, false negatives, things which are missed, and blue are false positives, which is uh, hallucinated structures. Now, do you see these number three and two here, and this means that the same circle is in the output three times. So, uh, parallel is, after the initialization, uh, it is not able to cut down uh, in the number of instances. So, many, very often you have multiple instances which are sharing points which could be easily uh, added, uh, like computed from, um, uh, assigned to a single instance. I also come back to this uh, picture. And people who are computer vision here in, uh, in the audience, they know, uh, w w they might have noticed interesting things. For instance, that there is a set of points here which end up with a nice line, correct cluster, but there is not a single initialization from two points from the same cluster. So somehow, Perl is able to find instances which were not sampled in the, initial, uh, in, in the initialization of the algorithm. We'll come back to this property a little bit later. Now, I just want to note that the richness of this multi-class, multi-instance problem, and maybe nobody of you when I presented the previous example, I had any problem of saying, okay, we have two classes here, lines and circles, but actually this is our choice. Um, we can treat this data as line segments plus circles, or line segments plus circles of different radius, or, uh, th or this one is line segments and coin circles of different radius. So in, if you have a method which allows easily to add a different class, you have a very flexible algorithm. And uh, the, the methods, per like methods, the multi-x that I'll be presenting, can quite easily handle that without any problems. So the, pro the, the method, when we observed, when we observed the parallel, we actually added one or two lines to the code that uh, made a huge difference. So, this is a slightly more formal definition, but again, we have the input data, we have M classes, think about it, lines, circles, uh, circles of different radius or maybe squares. We have, like in RANSAC, we are able to estimate model parameters of a class given a sample. We have a loss function for every class. Uh, we do have a special class with has a, which has a constant uh, cost for every point, which is the outlier class. We start generating instances by random sampling, like in parallel. But before we go into the alpha expansion, which takes the pairwise energies into account, we do mode seeking. So it turns out that uh, parallel generates often very similar hypotheses. And think about the half transform. In half transform, one model had one mode in the parameter space. More or less we are saying it is never interesting to keep instances which are in the same cluster, in the same mode like others. Then re-estimation of parameters, convergence like in parallel, some sort of remove uh, small outliers, clean up 
the energy, and that's it. Now, it turns out that, again, this small change makes a huge difference. And let's compare the run of the two algorithms um, on a synthetic example where we have um, 100 points on every line generated as inliers, 200 outliers, and we need some energy terms just for repeatability entered here, not interesting for you. And we start with generating 500 instances. Now, um, after the first step, Perl has exactly these 500 instances, but we have only, uh, we have reduced by an order of magnitude by just this mode seeking step, which is very fast. Then we run the alpha expansion. You can imagine the alpha expansion actually runs as many graph cuts as there are labels, so Perl already has like two orders of magnitude longer time. And then we iterate until we reach a solution. And again, in this synthetic example, we see the difference in the solutions that we reach it two orders of magnitude faster, plus we don't have this problem that multiple structures explain a single line. They are very close in the parameter space, but this is not in the parallel cost function. It does not know that the, the cost of assigning points to instances is, is just a relation between points and instances, and uh, we, we get this result. Now, um, it also turns out that if you do this mode seeking, um, the result is much less sensitive to the parameter which uh, weights in the cost of a, um, assigning pair of uh, neighboring points to different clusters. Okay, now experiment the results. It turns out that this works very nicely. So the first thing is finding planes in a pairs of images. Uh, Multi-X is almost perfect everywhere. If we look at Perl, um, it's not too bad, but it's worse. Also, this averaging, the mode seeking, has this property like if you have bagging, because you have the mode is an average, um, then it's, uh, it's also reducing some additive noise, and this, it's, uh, it's from random samples. So averaging from random samples gives you some uh, um, reduction of variance. So there's a variance reduction thing. Um, homography estimation, again, best. This thing is an example standard set where we have multiple objects which are moving. So this is multiple homography, uh, multiple et epipolar geometry estimation. Again, multi-X is by far the best, only once some uh, T-linkage wins. Uh, this is another problem which I haven't talked about. A LIDAR uh, data scans from 3D from a road, and there you are trying to find cylinders like this, planes, uh, and multiple planes. Uh, again, the best result, multiple motions, uh, best result. Maybe the interesting time is the processing time. So for problems, we had five problems here, lines and circles, homographies, two view motions, motions, planes, and cylinders. So multi-X is like close to, uh, it's, it's close to uh, real time, and uh, the standard methods are much, much slower because the multi, the, the, the mode seeking reduces the number of instances very fast. Okay, um, maybe there's one thing, and I will spend the two last minutes on this, to say that people are sometimes blind and Ransack has never used pairwise cost. But it turns out that once we think about a, a local optimization, there is no problem to put the pairwise term here, and it means do the local optimization by a graph cut. Nobody came up with that, and so sometimes simpler method can benefit from something more complicated, and the result is that if you run local optimization with pairwise costs, uh, you get state-of-the-art results. Maybe this is not important, but it's, it shows that RANSAC never was used with pairwise costs, but it's easily introduced there, and we get state-of-the-art RANSAC. So the conclusions are that um, simultaneous fitting of multiple models is an old problem. Um, the robust single class, single instance, single class, multiple instance, and multi class, multi instance are open related problems. I think they have multiple applications. Uh, I think that energy minimization combined with mode seeking outperforms the state of the art on several uh, MCMI and C CSMI problems. I sh said something about multi X, and I showed that RANSAC, which is a very old, uh, beaten to death topic with hundreds of papers, can 
be, still benefit from some interesting ideas, which is combination with energy minimization with pairwise terms, uh, which has been sort of neglected. That was the message. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, some questions to Yuji? So I wonder if that, um, so in the beginning you were talking, in the first part you were talking about the optimization of Fransag, the improvement on Fransag, and there you suggested to move this local optimization into the loop. I wonder if it happens sometimes that you start optimizing and you get some line composed of outliers, which is nevertheless, because you optimize it, it's so good that it prevents from um, correct hypothesis to overcome this barrier, um, if, if you yeah, know what yes. I mean. Uh, yes, it, yes, it can happen, and actually the locally optimized RANSAC is not like, first of all, people have proposed very complicated things for it, there is no guarantee. And I, introduced, I talked about the LO Ransack only, mainly, because I wanted to show this slide where I show the, that the pairwise term in the LO optimization stabilizes the solution very strongly because instead of all sorts of problems with is this in or out, the pairwise term tells you nearby points should go in, points which are far should go out or in together, and that with this you have global optimum in the local optimization term. So, okay, it could happen that you will go to some local optimum which is not what you want, but you can't do much better. So, uh, m m uh, so okay, that the first thing is heuristic. This thing says, given the current parameter of the, uh, of the, th the theta parameters, the local optimization is all, uh, goes to global minimum in the uh, so uh, I think this solves the problem. Uh, and my second question is whether it's whether it does make sense to use uh, uh, mean shift in this scheme. So whether it makes sense to put mean shift. We do exactly mean shift in into Ransack when you are looking for a single line. N no, but we are not using mean shift here. So if you look here, this is classical Ransack, and the only thing we changed is adding the pairwise term in the optimization. Right. So, so, so here it doesn't, doesn't exist. So uh, one would have to think that uh, the one advantage of parallel against Ransack is that you can easily parallelize. Ransack is not so easily parallelizable, and one could think that parallel has a competitive uh, approach, so you generate all possible hypotheses and then they compete like something that Nister proposed, something called preemptive Ransack, whereas Ransack is fully sequential. Um, so we are, we are using the pair with the mode seeking for multi-class, uh, multiple instance, or single class multiple instance, but we are not proposing it as, as Ransack because it has these problems of how many instances to generate at the beginning which the Ransack solves. On the other hand, now Ransack has the problem of what is the scale, there's no good answer to that, and Perl doesn't have it that strongly because uh, it's competitive. Uh, so it's like competes between each. Ah. Okay, one more question from Jean. Oh, it's coming. Have you, have you looked at uh, persistence diagrams to do the mode seeking? Mode seeking? Again, what? Persistence diagrams. Do you know what they are? No. It's, it's not, no, a, it's not a test. What was the question? It, it's something where it's, it's, a, it's a robust way to do mode seeking where you can eliminate easily uh -huh. modes that are very close to each other. Uh -huh. So uh -huh. you might want to look at it. Okay, so I will look into that. Like there are issues, of course, because which are sort of, I swept them under the carpet because we speak about modes and this requires you to have metric so in the space. But, but it handles you know, uh, va various input base with some topology on it, and then you can, you, you can decide mm -hmm. whether you keep. I mean, I'm just suggesting you have a look at yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so there are issues because as soon as you start requiring some sort of distance in the space of 
models which you didn't before, uh, then this, uh, the question of the mode seeking algorithm, distances, they come up and, and we have chosen only one. We have maybe the most interesting thing is that empirically it works very, very well and then you can move into sort of justified algorithms or something where you try multiple options.